Hey everyone! In this video, we're going to learn about Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation. We'll start by answering the question, what is gravity, and how did we figure it out? Then, we'll explore Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation, and how to use this equation. We'll see how changing the variables in the equation affects the gravitational force. After that, we'll walk through a few examples and see how gravity works on a large scale and on a small scale here on Earth. At the end, we'll talk about the difference between Newton and Einstein's theories of gravity and which one we should use. So, what is gravity? People have been trying to understand the world and the universe for thousands of years. One of the big questions was why do objects fall towards the Earth? Some ancient philosophers, like Aristotle, believed that the Earth was the center of the universe. Objects have their natural place, and a falling object is just trying to reach the center of the Earth. They thought that heavier objects fall faster, and things that were lighter, like smoke, naturally wanted to move upwards. People also wanted to explain what they saw in the sky. Why did the sun and the moon rise and fall every day? How can we predict the motion of the stars and the planets? When will we see the next solar eclipse? And most of all, who or what is causing these things to happen? Like before, people thought that the Earth was the center of the universe. It seemed like the sun, the moon, the planets, and the stars all revolved around the Earth. Astronomers could use telescopes to carefully track the motion of the planets. When they drew the orbits, with the Earth at the center, they weren't perfect circles. The planets seemed to wobble around their own circular paths. This view of the solar system lasted for over a thousand years. It wasn't until Nicholas Copernicus came along in the 16th century that people started to consider that the planets revolved around the Sun, not the Earth. That meant the Earth was just another planet, and not the center of the universe, which took some time to catch on. But now, the orbits seem to be perfect circles. An astronomer named Johannes Kepler realized that the orbits were not quite circles, they're actually ellipses. He also described how the planets move with what we now call Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Although we had a better understanding of how the planets move, we still didn't know what caused them to move that way. That's where Isaac Newton comes in. Around the same time that he was putting together the three laws of motion that we just learned about, he was also wondering what causes objects to fall towards the Earth. As the story goes, he was sitting next to an apple tree when an apple fell to the ground. Newton wondered, why does the apple fall down and not up or sideways? He thought there must be some force acting on the apple that pulls it towards the Earth, which he referred to as the force of gravity. This force must be pulling every object towards the Earth, no matter how high it is above the ground. If that was true, then maybe this force applies to every object in the universe, including the Moon. Newton realized that the same force of gravity that causes an apple to fall to the ground also pulls the Moon towards the Earth and keeps the Moon in orbit. And if Newton's third law of motion was true, then the apple and the Moon also pull on the Earth with the same force. The reason that the Moon didn't fall straight towards the Earth was that the Moon was constantly moving sideways in a circular orbit and its own inertia keeps it from falling. We're going to learn more about that in another lesson. But Newton realized that this was the force that caused the Moon to orbit the Earth, and it caused the planets to orbit the Sun. All of this motion could now be explained using a single force, the force of gravity, and it must be acting between any two objects in the universe. This is what we call Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation. By observing different masses at different distances, Newton was able to come up with this statement and this relationship. Any two bodies are attracted to each other by a gravitational force, which is proportional to the product of their masses 
and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Newton figured out this relationship, but he knew it was missing a constant, which he called g, that would turn it into an exact equation that lets you calculate the gravitational force. It took about a hundred years for the value of g, the gravitational constant, to be accurately determined by a scientist named Henry Cavendish. So now, this is the equation we use for Newton's law of universal gravitation. If we have any two objects, or bodies, as Newton said, then they each exert a gravitational force, Fg, on the other object. Since it's a force, it has units of Newtons. This applies to any two objects in the universe, which is why we call it the law of universal gravitation. These could be two planets, a planet and a moon, or even two small objects, like a cup and a book. M1 and M2 are the masses of the two objects, or bodies, in kilograms. It doesn't matter which mass is which, and it doesn't matter if one is bigger than the other. R is the distance between the center of each object in meters. Keep in mind that R is not the distance between the edge of each object. And capital G is the gravitational constant, which is equal to 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. It has units of meters cubed per kilogram second squared, which are just the units we have to plug in to make this equation work. There's a few important things to mention. We need two objects for this force to exist. If there's only one object, there's no gravitational force. The gravitational force on one object always points towards the other object. It's always an attractive force, which means each object pulls the other one towards it. And the same amount of force acts on both objects. These are a pair of equal and opposite forces from Newton's third law of motion. This is also a non-contact force, because the two objects pull on each other from a distance, in a similar way that two magnets attract each other without being in contact. It doesn't matter how far apart they are, there will always be some gravitational force between the two objects. Finally, you may also see M1 and M2 replaced with capital M and lowercase m. The equations are the same, it's just a different way to write it. Before we walk through some examples, let's do some proportional reasoning and see how changing each variable affects the gravitational force. If we double mass 1 and keep everything else the same, then the gravitational force also doubles, because m1 is in the numerator in this equation. Notice that the force on each mass doubled, even though we only changed mass 1. The same force always acts on both objects. If object 1 only has half the mass, then we only have half the gravitational force on each object. And the same things apply to mass 2. If we double it, then the gravitational force also doubles. And if we divide it by 2, the gravitational force is also divided by 2. So larger masses have a stronger gravitational force and smaller masses have a weaker gravitational force. What if we change the distance between the two objects? If we double r, it's squared in this equation, and it's in the denominator, so the gravitational force is actually divided by 4. The gravitational force is weaker when the objects are farther apart. And if we divide the distance by 2, then the gravitational force is multiplied by 4. So, the gravitational force is stronger when the objects are closer together. Now let's look at some examples, starting with the gravitational force between the Sun and the Earth. Keep in mind that this is not drawn to scale. We'll call the Sun mass 1 and the Earth mass 2, but it doesn't matter which is which. The distance between their centers is about 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters. The distance and the masses are pretty large, so we're writing them using scientific notation. So, what would be the magnitude of the gravitational force acting on the Sun and the Earth? Pause the video and see if you can solve it before moving on.
So let's start with the equation for gravitational force. The value of g, the gravitational constant, is always 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, and it has these units. Then we can plug in the mass of the sun, which is 1.99 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. Then we can plug in the mass of the Earth, 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Finally, we plug in the distance between their centers for r, which is 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters. And remember, r is squared in this equation. If we plug that into our calculator, we get 3.52 times 10 to the 22nd newtons for the gravitational force. That is the force exerted on the sun by the Earth, and it's the force exerted on the Earth by the sun. They each pull each other with the same amount of force. Notice that the two masses are pretty large, but the distance is also pretty large. In this case, we get a large gravitational force. Now let's look at the force between the Earth and the Moon. We'll say the Moon is mass 1, and the Earth is mass 2. Pause the video and see if you can calculate the gravitational force. We always plug in the same value for g. Now we plug in 7.35 times 10 to the 22nd kilograms for the mass of the Moon. And we plug in 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilograms for the mass of the Earth. Then we plug in 3.84 times 10 to the 8th meters for r. When we calculate that, we get 1.98 times 10 to the 20th newtons for the gravitational force on the Moon and the Earth. This is still a pretty large gravitational force. Now, what if we have a large object and a small object, like the Earth and a ball? What would be the gravitational force between them? We would plug in the value for g, then 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilograms for the mass of the Earth, 0.5 kilograms for the mass of the ball, and 6.37 times 10 to the 6th meters for the distance between their centers. That gives us 4.9 newtons for the gravitational force. This is a lot smaller than the other forces, but it's still significant. The Earth pulls on the ball with 4.9 newtons of force, but the ball also pulls on the Earth with 4.9 newtons of force. If both objects start from rest, we can see the ball will accelerate towards the Earth. The Earth also accelerates towards the ball, but its acceleration is too small to see because it has such a large mass. We talked about that in the video on Newton's third law of motion. The motion of the Earth and the ball might be different, but the forces are the same. Nothing changes just because one object is much smaller. This law and this equation work the same way for any two objects. Remember that the value of r is the distance between their centers. It's not measured from the surface of the Earth. And this picture is not drawn to scale. This distance that we used is roughly equal to the radius of the Earth the distance between the center and the surface. So, if we use the correct scale, the Earth and the ball would actually look like this. But nothing changes at this scale. The mass of the Earth and the mass of the ball are still the same. And r is still the distance between the center of the ball and the center of the Earth, which we can no longer see. The Earth still pulls on the ball, and the ball still pulls on the Earth, with 4.9 newtons of force. We're used to seeing gravity from this point of view, and we say objects fall down. But that's just because we say up is away from the Earth. So Newton's law of universal gravitation works the same way at this scale. When we think of gravity on Earth, the two objects are the Earth and some small object and the distance between their centers is roughly equal to the radius of the Earth. And at this scale, the gravitational force acting on the small object is called the weight force, or just the weight of the object, and we'll talk more about that in another video.
So if Newton's law of universal gravitation says that every two objects attract each other, why don't we see that with two small objects? Why don't these balls roll towards each other? Well, let's calculate the gravitational force that they exert on each other. We plug in the same value for g, we plug in both masses, 0.5 kilograms and 0.6 kilograms, and we plug in one meter for r, the distance between their centers. When we calculate that, we get 2 times 10 to the negative 11th newtons for the gravitational force that each ball exerts on the other ball. That exponent is negative, which means the number is very small. The two masses are not that big, so the gravitational force between them is almost negligible. And they don't move towards each other because there are other forces on each ball, like friction from the ground, that acts in the opposite direction. If the balls were one meter apart in space, where there's no friction, they would accelerate towards each other, but very slowly. It would take hours for them to hit each other because the gravitational force is so small. But even if it's small, there is still a gravitational force between any two objects in the universe. Before we go, we need to mention one thing the difference between Newton and Einstein's theories of gravity. We just learned about Isaac Newton's theory of how gravity works, which was published in 1687 along with his three laws of motion. According to this theory, two objects exert gravitational forces on each other because of their mass. So the moon stays in orbit around the Earth because the moon experiences a gravitational force from the Earth. This theory of gravity lasted for a long time because it matched all of our observations and measurements. But as we observed more of the universe and we got better at measuring things, there were a few places where Newton's gravitational force wasn't enough to explain what we saw. For example, the orbit of the planet Mercury was slightly off from the orbit you would predict with Newton's law of gravity. And, it couldn't explain why light bends around a massive object like a black hole. In 1915, Albert Einstein published his theory of relativity. According to this theory, space and time are one continuous thing called spacetime. Objects with mass, like the Earth, warp spacetime, and other objects like the Moon are just following that curved spacetime. There are no gravitational forces involved. Einstein's theory was able to explain the orbit of Mercury and light bending around black holes. And so far, it matches all of our observations of the universe, so it's technically replaced Newton's theory of how gravity works. But it is pretty complicated, and Newton's law is accurate enough for most situations, so we still use Newton's law today. There's only a few cases where we need to use Einstein's theory instead, like when we study massive objects like black holes. Or, if we need to accurately predict the orbit of a planet like Mercury. But the difference between Newton's prediction and Einstein's prediction is extremely small, about one one-hundredth of a degree of difference for every 100 years. But for most things, Newton's equation for gravitational force is accurate enough. We used this equation to send astronauts to the moon. And we can definitely use it to study gravity on Earth. Alright, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.